Okay, so um, hello everyone and uh, thank you Roy for the introduction and thank you for um, inviting us to speak at this seminar series. So uh, in this first part of today's seminar, I will first give a brief introduction to cryo uh, and then I will move on to provide a theoretical background for the cryo -EM structure determination algorithm that we that we developed, and this will sort of be a, pre uh, a preparation for the for the next part of the talk. So in cryo -EM, we have um, a solution of biomolecules or particles, and this is rapidly frozen to form a thin layer of amorphous ice. And then we put this ice lab inside the transmission electron microscope, and we subject it to a beam of uh, electrons. And then the electrons interact with the specimen, and this forms a um, projection image or a micrograph. And, and to the right here, uh, in the right uh, figure, we see an example of what a part of such a micrograph can look like. Now, the goal of cryo EM structure determination is to reconstruct uh, a 3D structure of this um, biomolecule. And because individual particles will adopt uh, different unknown shifts and rotations, and also because uh, the, the level of noise in data is, is quite high, um, this represents a challenging inverse problem. So the, um, the method that we developed build on top of Reliant, which is one of the uh, most widely used uh, software frameworks for cryo in reconstruction. And the very very roughly, um, the computational pipeline in Reliant uh, may be described as follows. So first, we start by, um, with a particle picking step, which essentially amounts to extracting subregions of the micrograph that each ideally correspond uh, to the projection of a single particle. And the resulting particle images, together with um, some initial model that you also have to somehow come up with, they are fed into an iterative refinement procedure. And this iterative refinement procedure um, takes place uh, fully in Fourier states, as is, uh, as is common in, uh, for, for cryo EM reconstruction. And, and in Reliant, this um, structure determination problem is um, formulated as a Bayesian inference problem. So this in particular means that we have to specify some sort of prior. And classically in Relion, um, one has used um, a Gaussian prior. Uh, and the Gaussian prior has been successful. Uh, however, uh, the goal of our project uh, was to try to incorporate more information rich priors within cryo EM uh, structure determination. So there is a lot, uh, we know a lot, uh, we have a lot of structural knowledge, for instance, we know that proteins are made up of uh, amino acid change, uh, chains, and they fold into secondary structure elements like alpha helices and beta sheets. So we, we have a lot, of, a lot of information, and um, we have, for instance, more than 150,000 structures in the protein data bank. But still, it's hard to capture this information by handcrafting, uh, manually handcrafting a prior function. So what we will talk about and see in this talk is how we can use machine learning to take advantage of this rich structural knowledge for cryo EM structure determination. So now I will move into a slightly more, um, I suppose, technical and mathematical part of this talk. And uh, our starting assumption here is that we assume that data is homogeneous in the sense that uh, all particles are identical up to a rigid body motion. And we also uh, assume that particle picking has already been done for us. And then we may formulate the cryo EM inverse problem uh, in the following way. We are given the 2D Fourier transforms uh, of some projection images, Y1 uh, up to YM. And these Fourier transforms will then be uh, some complex vectors. And each of these projection images uh, in turn corresponds to some particle SI, which is uh, just a shifted and rotated copy of, of the molecule X. And what we need to recover is the, the 3D Fourier transform of this molecular structure. 
so X actually denotes this 3D Fourier transform of the molecular structure, which will also be some complex vector then. And here we take a Bayesian viewpoint. Um, so that means that Uh, both the molecular structure and the data, we assume they are generated by some random variables. So there will be some CN values, the random variables Y1 to YM generating data, and some other CM valued random variable X generating molecular structures. And finally, we have uh, uh, random variables generating the particle transformation, uh, the particle transformation. So that is the, uh, the rigid body motion that are unknown. And, and the goal of Bayesian inversion um, is to recover the posterior uh, probability distribution. So that is the probability uh, distribution of the molecular structure X given the data Y. So here big curly Y um, denotes the whole complete set of, of projection images Y1 to YM. And then one can either try to sample from this posterior or one can settle with compute, computing some estimator that, uh, that should summarize it. And of course, um, one typically rely on Bayes' theorem that relates the posterior probability to the data likelihood and the prior. And in the uh, denominator, we have a normalizing constant that for this talk will not be important. So here we consider um, the maximum a posteriori or the map estimator. And this is simply defined as a, a maximizer of the posterior probability density. And by applying Bayes' theorem and taking a logarithm, this can, this is also, the, the map estimator also maximizes this L function, uh, which is just the sum of the log data likelihood and the log prior. So here um, in the sort of, uh, functional analytic inverse problem setting, the, the first term, the log data likelihood corresponds to a data discrepancy term, and the second term corresponds to a regularizing term. So then, of course, in order to compute a, compute a map estimator, we need to specify a log prior, and we also need to specify um, the data log likelihood. So let us first uh, talk a bit about uh, um, the, the data likelihood then. So we assume that the random variables y and x that uh, respectively generate data and, and uh, molecular structures are related, related by some uh, known forward model. So here H is a linear model that um, describes the physics of image, image formation and E is uh, a random variable representing noise. And so to proceed, we will assume that uh, this uh, conditional random variables are independent and we marginalize over the particle transformation G. And then we can express the data likelihood as a product of um, marginalized conditional likelihoods. And we also need to specify a noise distribution. And here we use a complex normal noise distribution with a vector sigma i um, that gives the variance. So it gives the frequency dependent uh, power of noise essentially. And, and with all these assumptions in place, we have this um, bottommost uh, equation that uh, gives an explicit, uh, an explicit expression for the conditional likelihood. So before I go uh, on and talk more about priors, I just want to say something about the expectation maximization algorithm that is used uh, within Reliance. So this is a, a popular um, method for computing approximate map estimators. And it's often used in cases where you have some unobservable latent random variables. And in cryo-EM, this corresponds to the unknown uh, rigid body motion, so the unknown shifts and rotations. And in this, in our particular setting uh, that I've just described, uh, the EM iterates uh, are given as a solution to this equation here in the top. Uh, and B here corresponds to a weighted back projection and K uh, will be some sort of linear filter. And um, <clears throat> uh, so um, the expectation maximization algorithm has essentially two steps. Uh, two steps, the first step is the expectation step or the E step. Uh, and this, um, the E step is basically to construct 
the probability measure that is used in the in the definition of B and K in that mean, in those mean values. And the M step or the maximization step, um, this amounts to solving the uh, the top equation here for X M plus one. So uh, in particular, we see that we need uh, to somehow uh, specify the gradient of the log prior in order to use the, the EM algorithm. And uh, so Relyon uses a smoothness promoting Gaussian type of prior with a vector value, the regularization parameter tau. And this particular choice of prior gives, um, gives a neat expression for the gradient of, of log t. And we can plug that back in uh, into the equation for the EM interest that uh, I displayed in, in the last slide. And we get a simple formula uh, for the M step, which is also uh, simple to implement and efficient to, to implement. So uh, in order to go beyond this kind of Gaussian prior, but still have um, uh, a computationally feasible M step, we considered priors that in a certain sense are close uh, to Gaussian priors. Uh, and, and more specifically, uh, in the top equation here, we assume that um, we, we look at priors that, <clears throat> or we consider priors for which the second term is slowly varying in X. And for this type of priors, we again get an analytical, although approximate uh, uh, M step formula or an, a formula for, for the solution of the M step. Uh, so essentially in the low, in the bottom most equation here, we can divide by K plus tau to the minus two to get the update for X M plus one. And yeah, this is, uh, this is exactly this, this update formula. So the part that I highlighted here is, is what we added uh, to the standard regular reliance. So now uh, we see that everything so far boils down to that we need to specify this uh, quote unquote known Gaussian part, which is highlighted. And uh, as I mentioned, it's typically very hard to, to handcraft good priors. Uh, but what one can do is to, to try to use machine learning and in particular deep neural networks to, to in some sense try to learn a prior. Uh, and there, there are many ways to do this. Uh, what we went for in this uh, paper is uh, something called regularization by denoising or score matching by denoising. So I will talk a bit about this here. So essentially the idea here is that um, we assume that we have some noisy version of, of X, of the random variable X that we call X tilde. So X tilde is just X, but we corrupt it with some white additive Gaussian noise with variance uh, new. And then, so uh, we also denote, um, we denote the probability density function of the noisy X by TKDE, where KDE uh, stands for kernel density estimation. And then there is a quite neat mathematical result that's called Tweedy's formula that allow us to express the gradient of the log uh, of the KDE prior in terms of the conditional mean of the clean X given a noisy X. So this is this S hat estimator. So if we use the KDE prior as a sort of proxy for the original prior P, and if we can somehow approximately compute this estimator F hat, then we have some method for computing the, uh, the gradient of the log prior. So now um, we, so, so the question is then how to compute this, uh, compute this conditional mean? Well, of course, uh, this conditional mean is also the minimum mean square error estimator. So that is to say, um, it, is, uh, it is the minimizer of this, uh, of this um, optimization problem in the middle equation here. But then, of course, we don't have direct, direct access to the joint probability distribution of, of the clean and the noisy X. But if we have some training data from this distribution, then we can think of approximating F hat using, uh, for instance, a deep neural network uh, that is parameterized by its weight uh, theta. So the, the discrete variance of 
the middle equation then that involves this expected value becomes an empirical risk minimization problem which is the bottom of the problem. So the weights that we, that we then actually used um, are, are given by this uh, empirical risk minimization problem. And then I also want to mention that, um, so, so this F hat, we can think of it as some sort of denoiser that denoises the, the noisy X tilde um, and tries to go back to the, to the clean, clean X. And then we see sort of the connection to, uh, to the name regularization by denoising and score matching by denoising. And uh, so now I um, will leave the word to Dari and he will, um, explain how we uh, generalize some of the ideas from RED and SMD to uh, incorporate a um, bit more complicated data characteristics uh, that we have in, in CryoEM. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Gustav. Let's see, there we go. Um, all right, so I will pick up pretty much where, <clears throat> where Gustav left off and start by saying that this project was primarily empirically driven. Uh, so our aim was always to try to uh, create a method that to the uh, best of our abilities uh, improves cry and reconstruction <clears throat> uh, and not more like a general framework like for instance, regularization by denoising is. And the first thing we did in that direction was to generalize our noise model uh, where we modify the noise model to have uh, the additive noise term being taken from a normal distribution with a covariance matrix that is dependent on X. Uh, this covariance matrix uh, function is takes basically the co uh, complex valued X uh, and outputs a complex valued covariance matrix. And everything is co uh, complex valued because we're in Fourier space. Now equipped with a denoiser um, or uh, a universal approximator function in general uh, uh, with a set of weights, which is theta. Uh, if you optimize it, uh, optimize the weights using an empirical risk minimization scheme uh, where the target is x hat uh, rather than x, um, where so x hat is taken from the uh, prior or the, uh, the true distribution of x, but dampened using the inverse of the uh, covariance matrix, we show that uh, this matches the gradient of the log KDE prior through this expression, where psi is itself an MMSC estimator where the target function is uh, the, uh, the covariance matrix, the inverse of the covariance matrix function. Now in uh, our particular case, uh, we noticed that the uh, the, this function uh, new doesn't actually have to be uh, explicitly defined. Uh, it's sufficient to have uh, values for new for each example of X that you have in your training data set. So you will, this kind of expands the requirements to have both X in your training data sets um, and also the uh, covariance matrix. Now we made an approximation here where we uh, set psi to uh, the inverse of tau squared. And tau is uh, a parameter that we calculate in kind of an online fashion through uh, if you have the during refinement, if you split up your data set into subsets, in particular, if you have two subsets, you can calculate tau through the correlation between the ind independently refined um, uh, reconstructions or re refined models through the Fourier shell correlation. So using this approximation and also of course the assumption that the KDE uh, prior is a good enough approximation of the true prior and like always uh, assumption that you have enough data sets uh, to train uh, your, uh, your denoiser, we end up with a, a prior expression that looks something like this where, uh, or sorry, the uh, a gradient of the log prior function that looks like this. Uh, we uh, additionally modified th this expression uh, with a, a kind of a conservative approach where we also let the, um, um, the output of the denoiser be modulated by, by the variance uh, estimation. 
uh, this was purely empirically based. So doing this and going through the EM uh, uh, approach, uh, you end up with an update formula that looks like this. And if you would disregard for this term here up here, uh, you basically get back the map estimator uh, update formula. Uh, and so the added term <clears throat> Um, starts with this little lambda parameter, which is also an empirical parameter that go, uh, goes between zero and one. And I will come back to why that is there, why we put that there. Um, and then the denoiser, which takes uh, x tilde as input, the previous um, estimate of x tilde. Uh, we uh, made an ad additional modification here as well, where we changed x tilde to being the most recent update uh, where, where you use the current B and the current K, the same B and the same K as here as input. Uh, and this is basically the denoiser gets an unregularized uh, version of, um, of, the, of the current reconstruction. And this we did this to uh, minimize the requirements made in the assumption uh, about the rate of change for the uh, prior expression. And of course, when you do the optimization of the network parameters, you will also need to uh, train using this type of input to the denoise. Otherwise, the distribution will look different and you will get uh, suboptimal uh, performance. The training data set that we use uh, is based on 543 atomic models uh, from the PDB data bank. Uh, these are all X-ray crystallography data, single protein chains uh, of about 40 to 100 kilodaltons. Uh, we uh, converted these atomic models to, uh, we sampled them on a three-dimensional uh, grid or a vol um, we turned it into a volumetric data set uh, using a um, very simple uh, uh, tool implemented in EMAN2. Um, which just simply for each atom, depending on the atom type, uh, samples or deposits Gaussians on, onto the grid. And uh, there are more sophisticated methods to do this, but because I should underline that this was a proof of principle, uh, we choose to just go with the most simple approach because there, there were so many other things we wanted to figure out before we even started thinking about these things. Uh, the uh, boxes that were generated, the volumetric data that was generated was um, fixed 96 uh, uh, or uh, boxes with 96 on each side and uh, each voxel is 1.5 angstrom. Uh, we projected, uh, sub 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 subsequently to doing this, we projected these uh, volumes down to 2D images, uh, about one, uh, 10,000 2D images in random uh, orientations and we added Gaussian noise. We did not uh, apply any CTF and we actually show that you don't need this. Uh, per the reviewer's request, we, show, we actually did experiments to show that you don't really need to include this here because um, uh, it doesn't actually affect what the denoiser gets to see. Uh, but I won't say much more about this. You can read or you can uh, ask about this if you want. Um, so basically this data set was fed into a line and a bunch of re reconstructions uh, was car carried out. And out of that came about 25,000 volumetric uh, uh, densities. Uh, and this was because we used all the intermediate reconstruction results uh, from uh, every, re uh, every EM iteration basically. Uh, and these were also augmented to um, about a factor 20 um, so up to about maybe 200 uh, 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 thousand uh, densities through rotations, uh, size preserving rotations. Of these about 23% uh, had a better resolution than four angstroms uh, and about 2% had worse than 10 angstroms. So there's a clear, clear bias towards higher resolution structures which is uh, problematic, uh, but we choose to just move on uh, because we wanted to we kind of wanted to kind of handle that challenge and see how how it turns out. And I will come back to this. The denoiser that we use is a so-called DNCNN. Uh, it's uh, it's a unit that is trained using a so-called residual loss uh, loss where the uh, L2 minimization is carried over not the uh, output of the denoiser to the, uh, to the ground truth, but rather to the residual between the input and the ground truth. So, and this does not affect any of the mathematical assumptions we've made in uh, previous parts of this talk because it's, um, 
it corresponds to a large skip connection or a residual connection from the input to the output, basically. So it's kind of a network architecture uh, detail. We use TensorFlow 1.15, um, and we use an uh, atom optimizer with L2 regularization of uh, network uh, weights. And this took about 21 hours per denoiser, uh, and we trained for about 27 epochs uh, on an NVIDIA 280 Ti. So uh, we trained a bunch of different denoisers. One of the denoisers that we picked uh, that was trained on intermediate reconstructions, um, we evaluated its results by single passes through the denoiser. The input, uh, we tried a bunch of different resolution, uh, resolution domains. The, in the lower solution domain, or, uh, the input uh, is, yeah, you see on the top row, you have the lower solution domain and higher resolution domain in the bottom row. Uh, the input to the network, the output, and the ground truth. We see in the characteristics in the lower resolution domains, uh, one of the primary characteristics is the rotational blurring or smearing that you see. Uh, and we noticed that the network pretty uh, accurately picks up on these and is able to um, uh, remove those. And I should mention that this result here shown here is a structure that is not that is significantly def different in terms of RMSD to anything uh, available in the training data set. So this is part of the test data set. And uh, in the high resolution domain, uh, we see that the background noise is pretty uh, efficiently removed uh, in the output of the denoiser. Uh, but also we notice that the details inside the protein are pre preserved pretty well. Uh, and we attribute this to, uh, uh, we haven't tested this, but it's kind of a hypothesis that the, the denoiser actually learns to recognize uh, protein features and is able to apply different filtering amounts to different region depending on uh, the, what it recognizes. Now moving over to uh, the uh, right hand side here, we, we evaluated how much the uh, output of the denoiser improves compared to the input uh, when comparing to the ground truth, the error uh, comparing to the ground truth. And we see that when you're in the lower solution domain in 10 angstroms, and above or worse than 10 angstroms, we see that the denoiser performs not very well. Whereas as you move past that and go to higher resolutions, it uh, incrementally improves until it plateaus at around four angstroms. And uh, we attribute this to two different reasons. One is that uh, at very high, uh, lower resolutions, you have very little structural details and it's pretty difficult to actually push, uh, to inject any additional structural features but also the fact that we have very little training data in this domain. So this could probably be improved uh, uh, if that, would, that issue was, was addressed. So to evaluate our assumptions made in the theory section where we assume that we have Gaussian noise, uh, we're talking about a denoiser de uh, when we have Gaussian noise, but when, when we don't have Gaussian noise, uh, we're talking about image restoration. So basically comparing uh, the function uh, that we uh, use to in this red, red framework, uh, whether comparing whether a uh, denoiser versus how, how it performs compared to uh, uh, image restoration uh, uh, network instead. We notice that, um, and I, I should probably just mention what this figure is. So each column here is our different structures, four different structures in the test test uh, data set, which um, is significantly different from the training data set, as I mentioned. And each row is different signal to noise ratios. Uh, the leftmost column contains the structure, which is uh, uh, generally shape-wise much easier to resolve. And the right uh, one is the most difficult one, is the most round roundish one. And the top row contains the highest signal to noise ratio. So the easier, uh, the higher up you are, and the bottom one, the lowest signal to noise ratio. And we see that uh, the uh, solid lines here show the uh, Fourier shell correlation with the ground truth. Uh, we see that the solid lines black here for regular uh, map reconstruction is uh, pretty much in all of these figures outperformed by both the uh, denoiser approach, the red with a equipped with a denoiser and the red approach equipped with a uh, image restoration network. And uh, uh, the, however, the uh, dashed lines or the dotted lines show the half map uh, emphasis, the correlation between the split of the two half sets of the data set. 
uh, the subsets. And we see that generally it looks pretty good until you get to the very difficult cases. And we see here that the black uh, dotted lines are, are much lower here. The correlation between the two half sets is lower uh, when using uh, regular, the regular map approach. However, when using the red approach, we see in both cases uh, significant uh, in inflammation or inflation, sorry, of the, uh, uh, of the half map FSCs, which suggests that the D, because we're using the same denoiser to inject structural information into both halves, where it is injecting uh, overfitted uh, information into the into these, which creates uh, an inflated uh, correlation between them, which is false because it's not correlated with ground truth. The ground truth correlation is still low, so we needed to address this. The way we choose to do this, uh, just before do, uh, mentioning that, this is kind of what it looks like when you look at the maps. This is the uh, the map estimation results, the regular one, you see, and this is the ground truth low pass filter to the same resolution. And you see that it's, it's not able to do anything, but it stops there. It doesn't try to do anything that it's not capable of doing. Whereas the red approach uh, has suffers from overfitting because uh, it goes to high resolution. However, the uh, correlation to ground truth is obviously off. There are things here that are not represented in the ground truth image. So to try to handle this, we went back to this image. And this actually goes back also to the lambda parameter that I mentioned in the update formula. This lambda parameter uh, could go between zero and one. And what we did was basically when you set this lambda parameter to zero, you fall back onto the uh, Gaussian prior because this becomes the the original map estimate, right? And if you set it to one, then you're back at the red, uh, uh, using the red scheme. Uh, so what we did was basically when we know, when we know, when we have very little confidence in the de denoiser output, when we know that the denoiser uh, performing poorly, we set the lambda to zero and everything above 10 angstrom uh, or worse than 10 angstrom, we set to zero. Uh, we set lambda to zero and everything above four angstrom we set to one and everything in between is just a linear function going from zero to one and we see that uh, the overfitting issue goes away uh, using this so-called uh, confidence weighted red however the uh, re refinement results for the other uh, structures that were actually giving good results using the the red scheme still don't, uh, they, they don't worsen. They actually, in some cases, are actually better. So red here shows the confidence weighted uh, red and the uh, blue line here or lilac one uh, shows the, the original or the, the red approach without confidence weighting. And we see that we are pretty much getting the same results. However, in the, uh, the most difficult cases, we see that the half map FSCs are not, um, are not impaired. And I should just mention, just to motivate why I'm talking about the half map FSCs. The half map FSCs, if you don't have access to the ground truth, the half map FSCs are the only, are the primary uh, measure of the quality of the reconstruction. So if you impair that, uh, there's really very difficult to make a, a scientific evaluation of the results that come out of it. And we were able to address that problem by, through the confidence weighted regularization by the noising approach. Uh, now, looking at some of the other results from the, um, uh, uh, the CW uh, red, uh, we, we also noticed that the angles are improved. The angular error is much lower for the uh, confidence weighted red compared to regular uh, uh, map est estimator, uh, which tells us that uh, it's not only the final refinement, final refinement results that gets injected with prior knowledge that improves the correlation to ground truth. It's actually the entire reconstruction uh, pipeline actually uh, be benefits from the injected prior knowledge because the angles are improved throughout the entire, they, they need to be improved uh, throughout the entire reconstruction. Otherwise you wouldn't have uh, the angular assignments of the part, individual particles wouldn't improve. So this was a reassuring. And uh, this figure shows uh, just some uh, volume slices out of, uh, uh, for comparing a regular map to um, uh, the uh, confidence weighted rate, uh, red. Uh, in the top, you have the ground truth. And on the left uh, column, you have regular map. And on the right column, you have uh, confidence weighted red. And you see that the correlation to ground truth uh, qualitatively improves as well. Uh, whereas here, we see that the overfitting issues also go away. 
And this is showing uh, isosurfaces comparing a regular map, uh, red, and the ground truth for two different structures from the uh, test data set. So for future works, uh, we stuff we're working on right now is to optimize the network architecture, the denoiser architecture. Uh, also, uh, to be able to push this beyond a proof of principle to actual real application to real data, uh, we need to generate accurate uh, an accurate forward model uh, to take us from structure that we get from the PDB database to a uh, cry -M reconstruction that, um, uh, that looks like actual cry -M reconstructions. And we're looking into um, uh, data-driven approaches for doing this as well. Uh, we are also uh, starting to migrate over to a gradient-based optimization uh, protocol uh, that gives much more robust results. And also, this should play pretty well with the uh, red uh, approach. Uh, so hopefully, we get some kind of synergy there. Uh, and also, there is a lot of software engineering going in there. So we need to basically uh, get a deep learning package uh, pa package together with Reliant. Uh, we switched from TensorFlow to PyTorch since uh, this work was done. And uh, the latest version, the alpha version of Align, actually has PyTorch incorporated in, into it, a CPU version for now, where we're going to switch to a GPU accelerated one soon. Uh, and also, we need to think about how to distribute the prior. So we imagine, basically, uh, a default prior that is as general as possible. And then if you have um, uh, some specific data set that needs better priors for that specific type of uh, model, or a type of uh, target, then you might pick another type of prior. And finally, I would like to just acknowledge uh, the people involved in this project. George Harris, my supervisor uh, at the LMB, uh, uh, and uh, Takenori Nakane, a postdoc in uh, Shores Group. Ostan uh, Aktem, which is, um, uh, was at KTH, he's still partially at KTH, he's moving over to Harriet Watts University. To, uh, to become a professor there uh, in Edinburgh. And Jonas Adler, a PhD student, a formal PhD student in Osan group, Osan's group uh, that um, has now moved on to uh, DeepMind. And Gustav that you heard uh, just before me uh, was also a um, PhD student in Osan's group and is now actually moving over to Carola's, uh, Carola Schoenlitz lab, uh, who is a professor at the math department in Cambridge University and then uh, we have uh, Sebastian Luce that was a PhD student also in uh, Carol Lachandley's uh, lab and has now moved on. And finally, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the organizer for inviting us and also all of you for listening.